thanks for the, the opportunity to, to present today um, and accommodating us on time as well. Um, just briefly on the introduction, um, we very happy with um, that the process of local loop bundling has got to this and um, that we managed to actually get to provide some feedback on um, on the regulations um, on well, the discussion document um, we su fully support the, the goals of local loop unbundling and um, we very happy that if implemented correctly I think it will go a long way in addressing the problems um, of broadband in this country just some of the highlights of, of the things that, that that's in our submission and also some of the things we're going to talk about today is really uh, something we believe in very strongly is that the dominant platforms on broadband should attract um, regulation and for us that is where where's the most subscribers on broadband in this market who's got the most reach and um, does those people give access to the platform for that and, and in this market for us the most dominant player is the mobile operators they've got far more broadband subscribers than, than um, what the fixed line operators has and um, and in all the discussions that happens, it almost seen, you almost get the sense that local loop and bundling is only set for, for telecom, and we strongly believe it's, it isn't. Um, the mobile operators are the dominant operators, and they should also um, be, t be looked at when, when um, looked at local loop and bundling. Um, then I think most importantly, if, if when one look at all the submissions made, it, it looks like there's a million and one reasons why local loop and bundling should not happen and could not happen. I think technically it's very possible. We've seen it in a lot of markets. It's worked, so it's no reason why it can't work in this market. Um, my engineer always tells me that technically anything can be done, so um, but I believe that, that it should be able, able to happen. Um, local loop and bundling will liberate the market, um, but the one thing that, that we need to remember is that we need strong regulation and strong regulatory oversight um, in that whole process as well. Um, just more, some more of the highlights in the presentation. Um, we do believe that proper pricing studies is needed to, to actually get it done because otherwise people are just going to fight about it. We do realize it will take some, target, some time and there will be arguments for and against it, so, so we urge uh, the um, ICASA to, to actually get those pricing studies done properly that, that it can stand the test of time and, and actually um, um, actually move this country forward. Um, because it will take some time, we do believe that there's some quick wins that, that one can implement in the interim where you don't have to wait for, for full local loop and bundling to, to, um, to actually get going. There are some things where that as a country we can make some progress in, in broadband that doesn't have to wait until the pricing status is done. Um, we also believe that local loop and bundling shouldn't be done in one big bang approach. It should be a phased approach um, to give the operators time to, to transition from where they are today into the, into the new world. And the same for, for the smaller operators, to f time for them to change their business models, get the capital together to actually implement local loop and bundling properly. Um, we also need the time for the regulations to be um, properly implemented and, and people to, to comply with it. And then we need to cast it to ensure that, that, that those regulations are being complied to. And that all said, no, it's going to take some time, but speed is of the essence. So the sooner we can get it done, I think the better for, for this country, because we already lag so far behind. So just in this presentation, I'm going to take you through um, just some of the the things that we believe it, that's caused the industry to cry so, out so loudly for local loop and bundling. So what are the things that we, that we battle, battle with? What should be unbundled? Um, I'll take you through some of these, these quick, quick wins we um, keep on talking about and then through the phase in implementation of, of um, LLU. <coughs> Excuse me. So I think, first of all, the, the issues in the industry, I think the cost of the IPC and the model that Telcom has today I think it's really driving everybody um, quite mad. It, it's dependent on volumes, but the cost of the IPC for MWIP, I can't talk about other people, is about nine times more than the cost of what it costs to go from Cape Town or from Mutanzini to, um, to Europe on international cables. And, and that's, just, that's just absolutely absurd. It, it shouldn't be that much. <clears throat> Secondly, the flow of traffic, the way that the IPC is implemented, I think it makes it difficult for the, for the ISPs to compete effectively. Um, 
and the, the operators, being in telecom, all the, the wireless operators, they don't they don't um, do uh, suffer the same restrictions as what the ISPs does. The the resulting effect of it is it causes more congestion on the networks because the packets just have to travel so much further and sometimes double up and down the network. I'll, I'll show you one or two slides on that a bit later on. And then um, just on the, the, the congestion that, that's not only on the telecom network but also on the, on the other networks, specifically on telecom, they're making lots of progress to actually get the, the congestion cleared up. But I think we need proper SLAs, and I think that's something that, that can happen in the, in the locally bombarding process to know that whatever you buy on the one side is what actually gets delivered on, on the other side. Um, the cost of the ADSL line rental, I think, um, is, is a big bugbear for everybody in the industry, and it's probably not the first time that, that you've actually heard that today. Um, and effectively for us, it's with the IPC model, the ISP pays for access to that last mile, and so does the customer. So if effectively, um, the, the, the telco actually gets money for the same, um, same piece of, of service that, that gets delivered. Um, I think as far as the wireless operators go, if you can get a proper wholesale deal out of them to take to market, it's, it's next, to, next to impossible. Um, the last mile pricing is exceptionally high, and they, um, they force you to take services that, that's actually not actually needed to actually get the data to the, to the end users. On the peering side of things, um, there's still a lack of open peering in this market by the big players. Um, where we believe that traffic should be able to flow freely between the, the various operators. That's still not happening um, to, in any meaningful way in this market. And if local loop unbinding is a way to actually solve some of those issues or not, uh, it's a bit unclear, but, but it is a big worry in the industry. And then the availability of frequency, I think, um, that that is holding back um, broadband growth, and, and that's part of the reasons why people want local, the local loop to be unbundled, because there's no other way to actually get to that end user. So, so it, does, um, it does play into why local loop is, is so important for us. So what should be unbundled? <clears throat> I think here I get back to it's not only the, the last mile copper that should be unbundled, it should also be the wireless networks that needs to be unbundled. They are the dominant players, and they've got far more reach than what, um, what Telcom has today. So there's no reason why they should shy, shy away from, from local loop unbundling. Um, we, we know that there's differences um, between fixed line and, and, and mobile, but if, if you look at it, in the, the, last, the second last slide I've got, if you look at it critically, there's no reason why it should be treated any differently. It, it's actually just access to that last mile that, that, um, that, that should be obtained. Pricing might be different in various other things, and we recognize the fact that for telecom and for the mobile operators, it's going to be difficult to determine that pricing. But we need to we need to start taking that that road and, and start getting there. As far as the quick wins go, there's really three things. Um, one is getting back to the mobile operators. Is that we need to have proper wholesale rates or proper solution in the market that that actually gives ISPs access to that market, naked ADSL, which everybody talks about, and then the reduction of the cost of IPC um, in the ADSL network. So I just want to unpack the, each of them a little bit more. So the mobile operators, um, they, if they do give you a solution, they give it to you in one, in one place. Um, there's no geographical breakout. The cost of the solutions are far more expensive one, than what the retail rates are that's currently in the market. So effectively, the, the guys are actually keeping you out of the market. And uh, and again, there's no reason why the same principles in local loop, uh, for local loop and bundling shouldn't, um, shouldn't be applied to them. Um, they've got a, the IPC equivalent, what they call the APN, but typically it's only, um, you're only allowed to use it for corporate customers. They do in cases allow you to use it for other services, but they won't stand behind you and, 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 and vet you that those services can be provided um, to, to retail rates. So for us, it, it really became a case of, if you look at how the market developed, is unless they'll see brought big change to the market, would things have changed otherwise and prices come down so dramatically? 
So if you've got proper wholesale pricing in the market and you've got people properly able to compete against these mobile operators, you can actually keep the prices down and, and actually make it far more sustainable and, and grow the market even further. Bring more competition into the market and, and get, get these big guys to move along, which they don't seem to move along unless some, somebody actually jolts them along uh, from time to time. Um, the, I think w one of the other frustrations has also been that, that we, whenever you good, do get some wholesale solutions, the pricing and the oversell ratios doesn't allow for you to be effect very competitive. So I think in how these quick wins get gets implemented, it's, it's important to make sure that the oversell ratios are taken into account and that this that, that the pricing is actually very competitive and not just slightly competitive. And if if you look at it in this in, in through your roast into glasses, that that you can say it's competitive. Um, um, from a certain point of view or not. So it really, we really need proper wholesale pricing to, to come into effect for, um, for these guys. I think if you don't do this, the, the problem is that you'll only have these big players playing in the market, regulating the prices, making sure that the things, um, that the things stay as, as they are, as we've seen in this market, unless somebody big is prepared to move, not, nothing happens. Where if you compare that to the ADSL market, where you've got a whole big number of small ISPs, and these guys keep on bringing out very innovative offerings, very price competitive offerings, and it actually does move the market, and and we've seen it time and time again. We need the same the same side on the mobile operating, otherwise the uh, the monopolies are just going to keep on carrying on doing to us what what they've been doing um, over the last couple of years. And it really just stifles growth and, and innovation. Second big win, Naked ADSL. And I think um, everybody's spoken about it, so the slide really goes and goes and explain it. But it, it's really just splitting the voice line and the data line. I think um, we we're quite aware that uh, of the the principle of the access line deficit. We still haven't seen anything that proves to us that there's an access line deficit. So there's still nothing to say that th this can't be done and it, it shouldn't be done and should be happen. There's a big market in the prepaid market that um, that uh, that people, if you're on a prepaid line, you can't get access to ADSL. There's no reason why that shouldn't be done. We'll be able, to, we'll be happy to take any prepaid customer tomorrow on ADS on a um, ADSL line if we could, but you can't because naked ADSL isn't um, isn't there. So I think again, it stifles growth, and uh, and it's such an easy win just to split the lines get it implemented and you don't have to wait for the big pricing um, studies to come in before it actually gets done. Um, Telcom already offers discounts on, on the voice services and on data services. You can apply the same discounts and, and get to a price for, um, for ADSL. It should be a fairly easy and, and, and quick one and for us to actually move forward. I think just on, on how, does the, how does the IPC model work? Um, most people know that, that you, you buy this, this big pipe um, today between the, the ISP network and the Sykes network, and that's how you break out into the internet, and, and, and really all the traffic has to flow over that link. So, so it really does restrict the, the other the other how the networks work. So if the price of that IPC cost is reduced, I think that's a, the other big one, is that um, you, you often you often hear that the telecom complain that say, well, if the price decrease, then they're just going to lose more money. I, I honestly don't think that will happen. I think people are so starved for bandwidth in this country, people will just buy more. And um, and we've certainly, as MWEP, we've done it. As soon as the prices come down, we just keep on buying more more capacity because there's such a pent-up demand by end users in this country for capacity that people just want to get more. And the prices are so high I think up to up to the point where you get to um, where where that demand is actually saturated, then people probably won't buy more. But we're still such a long way away from that um, b before we actually get that. So by reducing the price, Telcom won't lose a cent of revenue. I think they'll probably gain more revenue in the process as people buy more and they'll think of more innovative products to to actually roll out. Um, I think that the, the, there's a big worry that the, the current model lacks funct functionality and, and you can't really bring out a differentiated service. Um, and ultimately, where the pricing of, of the IPC have to go is, in our mind, lyric pricing. 
and it should be that of an efficient operator um, and, and, and that operates in the international standards. And, and I think this is, this is a bit of a dilemma because everybody talks about the jobs that, that should be secured, but now all the jobs that, that's in excess in telecom doesn't really make it an efficient operator. So who has to pay for those, those inefficiencies in, in the market? Um, and, uh, and should the ISPs or, or other market players actually carry those costs? So it, it's a difficult one, and I think that's where the, pr the pricing studies are so, so important. But because the pricing is so high, just compared to international um, pricing, there's lots of rooms to move for Telcom to actually reduce those pricings. Um, by way of example, we've had every year we had price reductions in the IPC, and this year's the first year we didn't have price price reductions. So it, it sort of goes against the trend that um, that the telecom hasn't given price reductions as people are, are actually implement, implementing um, more services. Also, what what what's happening is people are or ISPs are getting multiple links into the telecom network, reducing telecom's um, overall cost. Now, Telcom does pass on some of those savings, but not all of them. So you end up paying more, or you're paying less, but marginally less for more services that you, that you order. So I really do believe that there's lots of room to move in the very short term to actually get the IPC price, pricing down. Just by way of an example, just how the traffic flows work. So if you look at the top bit of the, of, of the, of the image there, um, if one ADSL subscriber on the Telcom network talks to another ADSL subscriber on the same network, they can really go, if they in in a same regional area, just to the local ESR and talk to each other. Where if, if you on on the ISP network, you have to go all the way either to Joburg or Cape Town or Durban, wherever you've got your IPC, um, switch the traffic there, and then move all the way back to uh, back to the end user. Now that just puts additional load on the on the Telcom network. So just by doing things slightly differently, it can actually reduce a lot of cost for telecom. And that in itself should have a big impact on the, on the cost of the IPC, that you don't have to haul all the traffic to one central place and haul it back, back to the same place again. So, so there's lots of opportunities there um, to, to, um, to save cost. And I'm sure telecom will come up with a million reasons why it can't be done. But if it can be done for their subscribers, it surely can be done for all subscribers. Um, so just on the on the phased approach, um, <clears throat> I think it, it, why we suggest the phased approach is, is a couple of reasons. I think first of all, we ha you have to take into account all the small ISPs that's out in the market. They won't be able if you go full local loop unbundling day one, they won't be able to afford all the network charges that that they have to incur, all the capex that they have to incur to actually go full local loop unbundling. So you might end up with a couple of bigger players that can afford to do that, that end up doing it, and, and, and you take out all the small players in the market. So there goes all your innovation, all your, all your, um, the guys that make, make sure that, um, that the big guys are being kept honest. So, and they've, they've kept the big guys honest for the last couple of years by bringing out these innovative prices. So, so by doing it in one foul swoop, I think you're really going to hurt the smaller, the smaller guys and you'll risk losing jobs in that sector of the market. So, so one should just look at the one side of the job spectrum. You should actually look at all the, the entire side of the job spectrum. And I think the same goes for somebody like Telcom. If you do it overnight, tel Telcom need, I think we all recognize that Telcom's got, got, um, they've got issues to face. And I think we need to recognize that and it doesn't help that we just scream and, and we steer ourselves blind to that fact. But we need to give, uh, so in a phased approach, you need to give Telcom the, the opportunity to, to actually change their business model and change the entire company with time and adapt to the changes. So if it happens overnight, I think you will suffer job losses. If you do it over a period, there's, there's no reason why, why that should actually then result in job losses. It's phased, people will grow into it. I think as a, as a regulator, you'll learn, as, as operators, we'll learn. We'll make mistakes along the well, we'll fix the mistakes, and, and we can move along and, and, and actually do it far better and far more effectively. So I think it plays into everybody's hands that you secure jobs for the smaller players, you secure jobs for the bigger players, you make sure that the small guys survive, um, and especially those guys, that's important to, to um, keep on innovating in the industry and, and keep, on, keep the rest of the guys to, to keep the prices down. I think my biggest fear is that you end up with a couple of two or three big players at the end of the day 
and these guys just dominate the market as they have in the past and prices remain high and we don't get the penetration that, that we need. You need the guys in the um, in the platelon to, to actually give services to guys where the, the big guys don't get to. So we need we need to look after these guys. Um, I think I've actually talked about most of these points. Um, sorry, get ahead of myself sometimes. Um, just want to make sure I didn't miss anything out. I think I've covered them all. <clears throat> so if you look at the phases, just what we propose is the schematic here just shows today what a ADSL network looks like. So you really get from the home, eventually to the DSLAM, the ATM network, the IP network on, on telecom, you sit with the ESR and then that goes on to the ISP's network through the, the, the IPC. Um, that's how it works today. So in the phased approach, what we say, the first, the first step is, it's not a very big step, it's just where we meet telecom on the IPC, just move the ESR from the one side of the network to the other side of the network. It is some capital investment, I think most small ISPs should be able to, to afford it. But it gives you it gives you a couple of things and it gives you a couple of uh, of key differentiators in the market. So um, now what you, now you know far better whatever data you push into that telecom network, what happens to it? Where does it go? You can give a better quality of service. You can put a bit more differentiated products in the market, and you can effectively start competing a lot more more effectively. It's not a big change, and I think it's an easy way to actually move things forward. Um, the big thing there is just the, the congestion on the back wall, which, which still remains a big problem where you don't have insight if there is an exchange from the DSLAM to the SR that, that might be congested. We don't know where it is. That still remains a, a big issue. And I think that in the process of local loop unbundling, we need to find regulations on how to address that congestion and how to manage it and how to get proper service levels of, uh, on that, um, on that, um, that issue. Then I think the second second part of it is, is a bit further down the line where you say, okay, well, allow now the, the ISP to put their 60 ESRs down around the country, connect it up with their own um, network, um, in, in the network, and then from there break up to the various DSLAMs on the, on the telecom network. Now, 60 ESRs, it's a big capital investment. Um, there's not sufficient network infrastructure in South Africa yet that's been um, opened up to the free market so it's not enough fiber in the ground so st still the investment today would be quite significant to get to those 60 ESRs and, and depending on who you use to, to get those, to this network you can either be DFA or Neotel or Telcom or Vodacom or MTN whoever you decide to use I think today the prices will still be quite high and I don't think to, very many people will, will subscribe or ISPs will be able to afford that. Um, so again, if you do today, it's only going to be the big guns that's going to be able to do it. They're going to get a competitive advantage over the small guys and they're going to play the, the small guys out of the market. So get the network, the, local, the national network infrastructures, um, those investments, time to happen, get those things in place, make sure that more people's got access to those networks. It's more affordable, um, it, it's more regional that, that you actually get into the areas where you should be getting to that. It's not just in the big urban areas that it's actually across the country. And allow that the, the time to, for, for, the, um, for the infrastructure to develop a bit more. Um, I think once we've, we've got the facility leasing issues that we sit with today resolved as well, that will go a long way and actually open up these networks and opening up facilities at these various exchanges that you can actually put your ESRs down. But today it's still very restrictive and, and still quite difficult to actually get access to that um, to those various facilities on, on the various network. It takes you months of Sundays to get anything done. So there's a lot more work and a lot more oversight that's needed in facilities leasing before this can actually happen. And, and, and it's still not going to happen overnight and, and I think as the industry and as a regulator, we need to work, work through those issues and through those problems. Um, and it's honestly, it's not unlike the rest of the world. I think any any place in the world where this has happened, I think access to facilities is, has always been a, a problem, and and the way that that the access is gained is, is always difficult. So, 
it's not not unique problems. It, it's it's certainly been done before. It's just the way it gets managed and and, and actually um, I always want to say policed, but um, implemented. That's probably the better word. Um, I think this this option does um, give you significant cost reductions for the provider like Telcom. So. For Telcom to say that the cost will remain just high, I think is wrong. I think you, by putting your own network in place, there will be lots of cost reductions on, on the Telcom side. If the cards play it right, they can even sell you the network access into those ESRs that, that you put down. Or it can be for the same token, Vodacom or MTN or Celsius or Neotel for that matter. It doesn't matter which, which of the operators it is. But Again, this, the same principles should be applied to each and every one, um, each and every one of them. Now, I think this is where we'll get a million and one reasons why it can't be done, why things is not possible, and th again, this doesn't just then go to the the fixed line operators, but it also goes to the mobile operators. It, it can be work. I think for the fixed line side, it's worked very well in countries like Australia, Belgium, Denmark, Ireland. You've got the entire list there. It's done, been done before. It can work and it can work very effectively. I think the last one, and, and this one that's it, 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 it shared locally, but still quite a far stretch for me. I, I think I think there's very little of the small guys that will be able to to afford that to actually go to the D Slam level. Um, if you go to this in day one, I, I think you you'll really hurt the market and, and isolate the market with a couple of big guys that can afford to do it, and then you might end up pushing up pricing. So for me, this is way into the future. Let's get the lessons done, learned, get the regulations right, and if it makes sense down the line, we, we implement. But to make to do it today, I think is a, is a bridge slightly too far, um, and and will actually end up costing the consumer a lot more. Um, where phase two, I think, is achievable, but I think we need to. There's a lot of lessons that we need to learn in phase one and get the proper pr pricing studies done on on the way there. Um, on the wireless side now, uh, I just want to flick back and forth here to, between the slides. So if you look at the shared local loop slide there and you compare it to the wireless slide there, I see very little difference between the two. So so it, it really got different elements. You've got the base station, you've got the base uh, base station controller, you've got the backhaul network, you've got your IP network, and you, then you have to break out to the ISP. So there's very little reason from 50,000 foot why what applies to fixed lines shouldn't apply to the wireless wireless loop um, and uh, again I think we, it needs to start I think the wholesale APN model has to be put in place and, and in place properly with proper pricing that's not anti-competitive um, the pricing should um, um, I think the slide is wrong it says pricing increases as volume increases it should be the other way around pricing decreases as volume decreases um, and um, uh, as it's just not competitively done today um, uh, there is a bitstream solution that you can implement for the wireless networks. Uh, they are by far the most dominant um, players on the broadband market today. Um, and uh, I think the rest of the points that uh, we've actually made. So in conclusion, just um, at the risk of repeating ourselves, um, I think we honestly need to go for the quick wins fairly quickly, which is the mobile op opening up the mobile um, offerings, make sure that the social rates are very competitive, naked ADSL, we need some significant price reductions in IPC in the short term, and you don't need to do that with big pricing studies. They, they, it's so expensive that it can be done easily. Um, then after that, the phased approach with IP bitstream, um, ATM bitstream, and shared local loop um, way down the line. Now, I honestly believe if we do this and we do this right, we can actually stimulate the, the, the broadband market in this country. We can stimulate the economy, bring growth, and, and, and actually stimulate jobs. I think that the thing that people lose out of mind all the time is that if local loop unbundling happens and there is risk of job loss in one side of the industry, you'll create a myriad of jobs in a different part of the industry. I think with the lack of broadband, we've seen that this country stayed well behind in, in the job creation because we simply didn't have the, the networks and the openness and the adoption of broadband. So. We'll never have a Google here for the next 50 years because we haven't stimulated that market enough. If we get it right and you get enough people on the internet, who knows, you might have a next Amazon or next cloud service or the next Facebook actually being developed here. And how much jobs will that actually create? So we must be careful not be, to be too short-sighted here.
and, and, and look at long term. And with a phased approach, I think you can actually manage that transition from one model to a different model very carefully and very effectively without putting any jobs at risk. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you very much, Emre. Thank you, Chair. I have just, I have just one question for MWEP. Vodacom submits that Bistream is not a facility and therefore the facilities leasing regulations cannot be used to, in this regard. What is your take on that? Yo, I'm not, um, not that strong on the, on the legal side. Um, uh, is, is it Bitstream in their context or Bitstream in the context of, of fixed mobile? I think it was addressed in the sense of mobile. Of, of mobile. Yes. I, um, yeah, I think Bitstream. I, I think Bitstream is quite different for the, for the mobile operators. I think you, you need to look at it so, something somewhat differently. Um, I don't think the facilities leasing regulations are the the best regulations to take forward for local loop unbinding. Um, but I do support that that we that that actually get used to get things going because otherwise it's going to take another month of Sundays for industry to comment and everything else so so I'm sure that the clever legal people can find a way in the regulations to actually write it in that um, that it should be part of it um, whether it, it's today not part of facilities or not I'm sure it can can be nominated as such just, just to add on, 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 on the issue, I think if you, if you also look at, at the Act, the way they've defined uh, an electronic communication facility, it says that it includes but is not limited to. So it goes on to a list that prescribes what, what it is, and I think we have not yet applied our mind uh, uh, to it uh, totally. But if you look at it, I think it's so broad enough that it gives you uh, an opportunity for you to interrogate as to whether in a mobile space can you also use the same definition to incorporate the elements of Bstream into it. So I think we need to just look at it very thoroughly and see. But from my uh, just pure reading of it, it looks like it's so broad enough that we should really interrogate whether it can be included in it or not. Um, you, you mentioned the Platterland. Um, does MWeb have uh, customers in the, the Platteland? Yeah, we do have we do have quite a few. Can't tell you exactly how many because it depends on your definition of, of what the Platteland is. I think um, today you can only break out IPC in three locations: Durban, Cape Town, and Johannesburg. So you can't really break out there. Um, but there's a great need for for more access in, in those markets, and um, there's lots of people on farms that that's got ADSLs. So yeah, they, it does happen. And in terms of smaller operators, or how, how many ISPs are operating in, in the rural areas? I'm not, not exactly sure how many, but I think you can go to any small town. Um, if you go to the X River Valley, there's a, a small ISP that, that use um, um, ISM frequency to give um, internet access. Mm -hmm. And they, they do it because they, there's very limited other choices. And they also do it because they can do it very cost effectively over big distances to the, to the farm. So they, there's lots of opportunities for, um, for those customers then to be taken to a fixed, um, a fixed solution or even a wireless solution on, on frequency or on, on lines that, that are far more efficient to actually carry the traffic. Um, so, in a way, you, you, you're suggesting that uh, the mobile networks might be un unbundled. Mobile networks might be a solution for rural areas. I think it's a very good good solution for that. Um, there's good spec. There's good spectrum. I think it depends what happens with a 2.5 gigahertz spectrum. But um, in an open access network environment, um, if, if if those spectrums are given to com platinum community, I think. You can do quite easily some 4G network in those communities that will serve them very well, and, and probably better than what you can do with a with a ADSL solution. Okay. And, uh, did you hear the uh, CLC presentation uh, this morning, which uh, unfortunately wasn't the, a plane, but Culver was here. Took the case study of Jane Furs and as as an example uh, of where there is a telecom exchange, but 
it not being used at the moment. Do you see any kind of business opportunities in, in that regard? I'm not, not sure what the case study was called. Can you yeah. maybe? I think, I think there is a merit in what uh, uh, Mutivi was saying where with regard to exchanges that are being underutilized because also coming from <laughs> that part of the world, uh, accidentally, is that <clears throat> we, we tend to, to, to have a thinking that because of the, the, the poor, because the region is so poor, then any element that goes into sophistication of uh, internet and so on will not be the, something that people will be, will be looking forward to. But I think the experience with, uh, with uh, cell phones uh, tells us otherwise. I mean, uh, even in those areas, you find them on Facebook, you find them on Twitter. So as long as the, there is an opportunity for, for people to have access to a particular thing, just because they happen to be in the underlying areas doesn't mean that they won't have that capability to do it. Actually, I think they, there are people that uh, perform better in, in Facebook and Twitter than any people in, in the suburban areas. So for the mere fact that there are exchanges there lying around, Telcom, Telcom might have not seen an opportunity of using those, but there might be people out there that are seeing an opportunity because Telcom is much bigger. If they are going to make very little margins out of it, they might think it's unattractive to them. But for somebody else, it might be something that they can base their business model on to, to survive in those areas as they have very little options to survive. Just one more on this. Um, so do you think it would be a good idea if out of this process, you know, we're talking about setting up working groups on different elements of, of LLU, do you think there would be value in having a working group on rural unbundling and enterprise development? And uh, would MNET be interested in participating in such a group? We, we, I think there will, there, will, there will be merit in, in setting up such, such groups because, you, I mean, the, the more broadband re, uh, reaches more people, the better for the country as a whole. And if we are just going to focus on the areas where there is uh, bigger economic activity, I think we're doing injustice even to ourselves. So setting up such, a, such an initiative, I think it will be to the benefit of the country as a whole and seeing what could work in those areas might also assist the country as a whole. So we'll definitely participate in such a Yeah, there's a big opportunity there, mm -hmm. I think. We definitely will do it. Thank you, Chair. Um, what are the benefits to telecom of IP stream? of introducing an IP stream type product? I think if, if, if done correctly, you, you can end up selling a lot more capacity on the existing network and I think you can, you can switch your existing asset a lot more and, um, and I think there's big benefits in, in, in volumes. Ultimately, Talcos, it, it's a volumes game, so the more volumes you can put on the, your network, um, the, the better. So. Um, if it's done properly and, and done correctly, this MWIP will certainly buy far more capacity, so they'll make far more revenue out of it. In an environment where you have steadily increasing ADSL uptake, do you are you of the view that, for example, an introduction of an IP stream product would actually put pressure on Telcom to increase employment rather than decrease employment? It's a, it's a difficult one to answer. That um, don't know how, don't know the in depths of, of how many people are there and in which areas they are. But um, uh, if if volumes increase and there's more uptake in, in ADSL services, I can't see why it shouldn't increase. Um, it shouldn't increase job and, and create more jobs. Um, but you have to ask yourself a question: Is What's the efficiency ratio of those those people or not? It, would it just be making them more productive or not? I'm not sure. It's it's difficult to answer. So if I assume that MWeb is efficient, if and you had access to an IP stream product, would you be forced to employ more people if the uptake of your services was to increase? I wouldn't say forced, but I'll definitely employ more people if um, there's more uptake in services.
Thank you, Chair. Uh, my question is related to, to your slide number eight. Which slide? Eight. Slide eight. Uh, is it IPC uh, a substitute for Beastream or a processor for Beastream? I think it's all a matter of opinion. Um, it, it's probably, I, I think it's a, it's a forerunner of, of Bitstream. Um, it, it, it really depends on how you implement it and, and, and how the other reg regulation com comes out at the end and, and what gets decided at the end. Um, IPC is definitely seen as some part, some form of local loop unbundling in, in some markets. So um, it's definitely it's on the way there. Uh, if the IP stream cost could be reduced, do you think it's going to do any good in terms of LLU or in terms of increasing the penetration? I, th I think it will. Uh, I think it will do the world of good. If if the price is half tomorrow, I'll buy double the capacity. There's no question about it. Thank you. Um, you presented an interesting concept on the GPRS support node. And I have two related questions. First one is, um, do you have a practical example of where this has taken effect? And secondly, have you had an opportunity to, to discuss the model with any of the mobile operators? I think South Africa is in quite a unique position because our fixed line penetration has, has lagged so far behind um, the rest of the world. It actually gave the mobile operators the opportunity to just leapfrog where, what, what has happened on, on, the, on, the AD, on the ADSL side. And it's actually quite sad that it's actually managed to happen because I think ADSL today for a lot of the things that's happening on the internet like video and streaming and, and, and video streaming ADSL is a far far better technology so it's actually quite sad that that we got to a state where where the mobile things the, the mobile has overtaken has overtaken um, fixed line um, in the rest of the world it hasn't I don't think they've made much progress in actually do um, unbundling the, the the wireless loop, but there it's not the dominant it's not the dominant way of accessing um, the internet. It's not the dominant broadband platform. In this market, it is. And uh, why should we follow the rest of the world in in this example? Why what, can't we be leaders on, on this one? Is, was that, was that both the questions? No, the other one was that you had a chance to discuss this particular model with any you know, of the operators. Ooh, there's far too many of them sitting behind me here, so it's going to be a difficult one to answer. Um, it's lack of better judgment, I'm going to do to say this in any way. <laughs> it's far easier to talk to telecom than what it is to talk to any of the mobile operators. You just simply don't get anywhere. It doesn't matter how you talk to the mobile operators. Um, they'll string you along. So I haven't discussed local loop unbundling with them, but certainly have discussed for years and years getting a proper wholesale um, discussion together, unsuccessfully. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Okay, on, again, on um, slide number eight, uh, you said it's critical to unbundle the wireless, uh, the wireless last mile, and other operators like MTN, they are against that. Do you have any model or anything to propose on that regard? Uh, I, th I think it's fairly easy. I think one, I, one can easily look at what the retail rates are that the, mo that the mobiles are operate, operate, offering in the market today. And then simply just apply those to what they what they wholesale in the market, and either have a cost minus or, or sorry, cost plus or retail minus principle as a start. Um, but I mean that that's um, I guess up to to cost to decide what what is best. Um, I would certainly say I think what would be best is if it's a similar model than what what Telcom has today, but. I think it might be a step too far for the first step. You might have something in between and, and look at where the history of our ADSL developed. That might be the next step to say, okay, well, it's, we're not quite there yet, so let's take it step by step. Um, so yeah, I, I, I would say 
long answer. Um, I would say look at the history of how ADSL developed, and, and, and that's probably the best model to phase things in and, and get things going. Um, okay, so you're saying we should go for Bitstream as a quick win. Uh, how quickly do you think this could be implemented? Uh, firstly, with regard to uh, telecoms fixed uh, infrastructure, and secondly, with regard to mobile infrastructure. Well, I think Bitstream is for me a little bit further further off. I think the quick wins are, are really naked ADSL and, um, and reduced pricing on the IPC. I think Bitstream getting into the realm of all the pricing discussions that's going to be had and what's the efficient operator and and all of that stuff. So I don't think Bitstream, by just moving the ESR from one side to the other side, is that quick a win. I'd love for it to be a quicker win, but I think if you're not going to get those pricing, stra stra those pricing studies done right from day one, it might just be a red herring and, and we might just be barking up the, up the wrong tree. I'd much rather look at getting IPC pricing reduced fairly quickly, then do the proper, uh, or at the same time doing the proper pricing studies on um, on Bitstream and, and the rest of the operations and get things then implemented properly. I think in the long term that's going to stand the entire industry in far far better stead than, than just trying to get a quick win on, on, on Bitstream. Because uh, unless, uh, unless we've got the, the proper benchmarks, I think it's always going to be difficult to go back and then argue for more. You need the proper benchmarks of what, what is that efficient operator, where should we start off with. And you might not start off at the best price, but if you have a way to work towards the best price, that, that, that might be a different way of looking at it. Uh, re regarding the open access approach which the authority is following uh, regarding chapter 8 uh, if MWeb is investing in any fiber networks would you be averse to the authority saying that this must be an open access last mile fiber investment um, it should only be fair that it, that it should be open Do you have any questions from the floor for MWeb? I was expecting some after the comments I made. <laughs> <laughs> we have a question from Natibi Ramusi of Celsi, who presented earlier today, uh, directed to you. Uh, could you please elaborate more on what you mean by wireless? Does this include two-way radio? Um, no, I'm talking about the, the dominant platform here, and the dominant platform is 3G, and probably the evolution of 3G uh, okay. going forward. Right. I assume your reference to unbundling of the wireless local loop is not only limited to mobiles. Please explain. No, it, it can't be. It should be um, even even how the frequency that the, the YMAX or LTE frequency gets um, allocated. That must also be done on an open access basis. Okay. Uh, and that would include fixed wireless as well, would it? I need to get back to you on that one. I need to apply my mind on that. Okay. And the second question is, how do you unbundle the wireless loop? The same way you do it, the fixed loop. <laughs> okay. And the third question is, don't you agree to Celsius' pr proposition that unbundling provides a window of opportunity for enterprise um, development and job creation. This would be that, don't do, I agree? Do you that? agree that Celsius' proposition that unbundling, uh, and I presume they're referring here to the fixed line, the copper yeah. line, fixed line, uh, provides window a window of opportunity for enterprise development and job creation? Yes, I do, but it has to be in a managed process and mm -hmm. it has to be done very carefully. Any further questions from the floor? Panel? Anyway, thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. much.